So uh, with this, we start today's, um, where are we here? Yeah, today's uh, webinar. Um, I am very pleased to be introducing today our speaker, Luisa de Sordi from the University of Sorbonne in Paris, France. I got to meet her and her work a couple of years ago at the, at the I care course in uh, Annecy, which is a course super focused on antibiotics um, R and D, and it's actually open for uh, registration for this year. Um, I will leave a link in the in the chat for anyone that might be interested. Uh, Luisa is going to talk to us about something that we talk often, but she's going to give a interesting perspective on it, which is the use of bacteriophages to treat bacteria. Um, She's also going to be interviewed for our podcast, so she's going to talk a little bit more about her personal work and her paths in the work that she's doing in that interview, so just keep tuned for that. But for now, she's going to be presenting here her work, and I'm very, very happy that you're here. Luisa, I give the floor to you, and thank you for joining. Thank you very much, Eva. Thanks for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to be with you today virtually in uh, Sweden and such a great center working on antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. Um, so little spoiler alert, as, as Eva was mentioning, I will be not be talking about antibiotics. However, uh, what I will talk about is um, other great enemies of bacteria, which are their viruses or bacteriophages. Uh, so, as Eva was saying, I'm based in Paris and Sorbonne University at the Saint Antoine Research Center. Uh, so what I put here, uh, I'd like to, to say is not the view from my office, which is far less interesting, but I wanted to show you our favorite spot in Paris. So now if you forget the big iron thing that you all know, uh, this is the Seine River. And that's where we find most of our intestinal bacterial pages. And students love to go there and pick water and we find pages from there. Um, so I try to follow the very precise instructions of Eva, and um, so I split um, this talk in three main parts. Uh, first one is the general introduction of bacteriophages and phage therapy, and then we go more into the work we are doing uh, with intestinal bacteriophages and how it can be used to, to treat bacteria within the gut microbiota. So at the end of each section, uh, I will stop to ask if you have any questions, but please feel free to, I guess, use the chat or uh, interrupt at this um, moment to, to ask whatever you want or comment or um, uh, tell me your thoughts. So first of all, uh, I'll try to see if this is, yes. Um, first of all, what are bacteriophages? So they are the most abundant biological entities on Earth. Uh, with a number estimated around 10 to the 31 bacteriophages, so which is a number I can't even wrap my, my head around. Uh, but just so to all know, it's estimated that there's 10 bacteriophages for every bacterium on Earth. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if for every bacterial species there's bacteriophages, bacteriophages are also ubiquitous and they can be found in any environment to the sustain bacterial growth. They go from extreme environments uh, like uh, hot or very cold environments to any uh, microbiota or ecosystem inhabiting uh, plants or animals. Bacteriophages are also the deadliest predators on planet Earth. It's estimated that they kill half of the war bacteria every two days. Uh, and I'll leave you a second to work it out. That means that they have a great ecological impact in every ecosystem. Uh, to regulate the abundance and the diversity of the, the bacterial composition. So we know different bacteriophages with different morphologies, different cycles, different um, genetic material. And here you have a little uh, overview uh, of the morphologies we have and uh, their genetic material that can be like for any virus, DNA or RNA, or single stranded or double stranded. Um, the phages you're probably most familiar with are this one here, the phages that have a tail or codoviralis. And there's a reason why you're more familiar uh, with that is because uh, they are the most known bacteriophages and almost the, the 
um, the highest percentage of phages we know belong to this Codoviralis family, which are composed by a capsid, which is where the genetic material is, and a, a tail and the tail fibers that are responsible to um, attach to bacteria. So phages have different life cycles, like any virus. Um, here we'll present you like the most known ones. Uh, they always begin with a step of absorption, which is the specific recognition of a bacterial receptor at the surface of the bacteria that mediates the absorption of the phage and the ejection of genetic material. Like differently from what happens for, for example, eukaryotic viruses, for phages, the, the capsid and the external part of the proteins never enters the bacteria, it stays outside. And the, um, the cycle I will talk most today is a lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle is based that on the fact that when the genetic material is inserted, it's basically programmed to take over the cellular machinery of the bacterium, uh, which becomes a factory to make uh, more viruses. So the genome is uh, transcribed and replicated uh, to make new particles that will eventually exit the bacteria after its lysis. And this lysis here is also very important because it's mediated by specific um, enzymes from bacteria called endolysis that also are um, used for therapeutic purposes. So this cycle here is typical of virulent phages. They are the phages that are used for phage therapy and the therapeutic applications. But there's also different type of cycles because um, phages can integrate their genome within the bacterial cells. In the lysogenic cycle, for example, the, the genome of the phage gets integrated within the chromosome of the bacterium and gets replicated with it as, um, uh, during the bacterial replication. And after a certain uh, stimuli that can induce the excision of this genetic material, um, the lysogenic cycle will go back to a lytic cycle, which is devoted to produce new phage particles infecting other bacteria. And this is typical of temperate phages. In real life, what we just see is that, uh, like for example, in this picture here, this is an E. coli cell, uh, which is attacked by bacteriophages in green. And at the end of the cycle, the cell um, definitely explodes to release the new particles that will go on and infect um, different hosts. So phages were discovered um, at the same time, uh, approximately and uh, independently by uh, two scientists, Frederick Tort, who was um, in the United Kingdom, and Félix Dorel at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, they both realized that uh, there was an invisible, filterable um, element that could lyse bacteria. Now, if you look at the dates, you see that uh, we are in, in the middle of the First World War, and while uh, Frederick Tour did not carry out uh, this, this ritual as he was engaged uh, with the British Army, Felix Dorel, uh, at the time was Canadian, uh, kept working on these bacteriophages, and he was acting the person that called these viruses bacteriophages, so bacteria eaters. And the first application that he could uh, think of of these uh, of these viruses was a therapeutic purpose, and is the, actually the father of phage therapy. And while Frederick Tour was fighting the war, Felix Dorel was helping the troops uh, that were affected by Shigella infection. They were really um, it was a problematic situation of diarrhea with, uh, within the within the troops. They were treated with uh, these uh, viruses, and from there. It started developing this kind of therapy against uh, different bacterial infections. And what I put you here is um, an overview of the expansion here of phage therapy. Uh, we have to, to focus, of course, you're all aware that there was no treatment for bacterial infections at that time, no, no real uh, targeted um, solution for infectious disease. Um, so this expansion um, interests uh, many parts of the world, but then came to a rapid decline. And this decline was um, mediated by two things. First, there were um, th this kind of approach was not, it was not controlled. It was more of a pioneering work with many difficulties in terms of application and different results. And at the same time, the thing that you all know is that another therapeutic um, 
approach developed the known massive expansion and followed the discovery of antibiotics. And so phage study has this, this rapid decline while um, antibiotics, they were easier and cheaper to produce, take, took over the world. And, and followed by the golden age of, of um, antibiotics, the development and discovery of different uh, compounds. If this is true for a big part of the world, this was not true for what was at the time um, the uh, Soviet Union. So, so sorry, here you see that well, uh, penicillin was the thing that killed uh, phage therapy effectively, and it was this massing campaign and uh, penicillin made the US win in the war. So as I was saying, like in the Soviet Union, that was not the case and phage therapy never stopped actually. And they developed like, uh, there was a huge progress, scientific, technological and, and therapeutic progress in using these uh, uh, viruses for, for treating bacterial infections. There was also a huge amount of uh, literature that only came uh, to light for us after um, at the end of the Cold War, so in the 90s. Um, and the results of this expansion of phage therapy in the Eastern, in Eastern Europe is still seen today as um, Russia and especially Georgia uh, are countries that uh, commonly use phage therapy. Um, not only they have phage therapy um, used at the hospitals, and especially what's probably more known to you is the Aliava Institute in Tbilisi in Georgia, where uh, people come from all over the world to get treated with phages. But different phage preparations uh, towards different pathogens are uh, available in, in pharmacies, which is not uh, something we have in, in Western Europe or anywhere else in the world. But if we go back here, you know also very well that um, starting from the 90s, especially, we had to start thinking as something that could uh, be an alternative or a combination with antibiotics. And that was due to two main things. Um, the main one is antimicrobial resistance, and I don't have to tell you anything about it. And the fact that we are running out of, of uh, new molecules that can uh, be used in this sense. And so starting from the 90s and most of all in these centuries, um, more and more studies, both academic and uh, fundamental research and in the clinic start developing to try to contrast um, the, the, the problematic of antimicrobial resistance. And what we see today, it's a, it's a new boom of clinical trials involving phages. Um, more and more are starting, for most of them, I'm not even able to tell you uh, the results because uh, they're still running or in progress or they're setting up. But so if we, if we have to do this seminar again in a, in a couple of years or two, three years, probably I will have to um, update and have more results. So what we know to now, there's a few trials that was carrying, were, were carried out. A big one in Europe was called Fagoburn. This study, for example, was not conclusive. And this is because um, of different technical difficulties in recruiting patients in tighter of phages. Uh, they were not expecting as it was a very pioneering work. Um, more and more are starting now, but what we do know is that in Europe or in the US, phage therapy is not approved by the um, uh, pharmaceutical agency. What is approved so more and more is, is a temporary off-license use of phage therapy, which is what called compassionate use. Uh, compassionate use takes place once all the other therapeutic options are uh, failing. And also in this case, we have more and more um, data that are supporting of the action of bacterial phages in the clinic. The limitation being that is a case-by-case -case application determined um, from the conditions of single patients. And it's quite hard to draw conclusions on a general basis in terms of a general application of clinical trials. So there are two paths, they're running in parallel, uh, but they're still very important to give, give us um, information. So this is a very short and first uh, um, introduction on, on phage therapy to, to make uh, the point. And if you feel like you wanna stop me here and uh, 
ask a few general questions on this part, feel free. Otherwise, I will go on. It's very interesting. I don't know how many of our uh, attendees were already knowledgeable that phage therapy is, was actually, is actually used in some parts of the world. Uh, I have a question. What, uh, for what purposes are these phages used mostly in Georgia and Eastern Europe? Oh, that's a very, very general use as opposed to what we have uh, today. There's uh, preparations that go from gastrointestinal infection, bladder infection, uh, topical use of phages with topical preparation. The most targeted bacteria are the bacteria that we all know that cause problems from Staph aureus, Klebsiella, E. coli, uh, Pseudomonas, of course, at different sites, both at the uh, local site and in more complex environments. So, so at, uh, at the actual hospital, there's wards like in every hospital, and the gastroenterologist will use it for something. At the idea pathologist, uh, something else is at home. Linus is asking any information about the mucophage trials that are the ones on the slide that is completed? The mucophage um, is not yet uh, finished. So it's, it's, uh, it's based in France. France, where I'm based, is quite um, active. And I, I don't have yet information. We have a nice uh, phage uh, uh, community in France that we have local meetings. There's one coming up. I'm really hoping to know more about it. Um, and I'm curious. Um, so these countries, they don't need to abide to European regulatory. Do they have any sort of regulatory systems that are looking into the potential effectiveness of these phage therapies? I mean, in the East. Yes, um, absolutely. It's just that it doesn't go into the regulatory framework that we set up for certain countries, but um, trials are very controlled. And as a matter of fact, many of the phages that now are tried in the West come from Georgia, where they have a huge experience, they have huge banks of phages. So we have reports on um, effectiveness. Um, Poland, for example, has a very nice street uh, reports after, after use, um, but it's true what is true and it doesn't fall in the regulatory framework that we have. And that's pretty complicated with phages. They're not really drugs, they're, living, they're not living things, but they're things that evolve. And these are some of the things I will also talk about uh, in, the, in the rest of the talk. And it's quite difficult to put a frame in terms of um, to, to, to regulate something that is, is replicating, that's more or less according to how many bacteria there are. But yes, yes, we have, do have indications for every country. I guess the question by Vemi now, it, it's a bit related to what you just said. Uh, she's asking, since they are living things that would grow mm -hmm. and replicate, how do you stop them when their job is done? Does it ever get out of hand? <laughs> That's a very good question. I will talk about it uh, later on in the talk, but uh, I can give you a little spoiler. So if it's true that phages replicate, the contrary is true too. They auto limiting because uh, since they are obligate parasites, as soon as the job is done, so they, they drop the bacteria concentration, um, ecologically, they cannot exist um, a lot of phages with few bacteria because they need bacteria to replicate. So what happens is that as soon as the bacteria drops, the phages drop too. And I will show you a little, some examples later on, but it's very good because now I introduced the topic already and it's, it's gonna be much easier. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we can continue with the presentation and then take more questions at a later stage. Sure, it's been my pleasure. Um, so for the rest of the talk, um, my slides don't want to move. Yes, for the rest of the talk, I will frame whatever I will say in a very specific environment, which is the gut microbiota. Now, in a very simplistic uh, way, the gut microbiota is this amazingly fascinating community of diverse microorganisms in habitant the, the gastro, the all in gastrointestinal tract of humans, but of course animals uh, as well. And they're composed by bacteria, of course, viruses, archaea, and fungi. 
And all together, these communities believe to live in an equilibrium with, with the host and assure different functions. They go from metabolism and digestion of your nutrients, and this is the function we, we all know since centuries, but more and more functions are being discovered. They produce vitamins, they protect against pathogens that their competition um, uh, property. But also they are great modulators of the immune system and the nervous system. And this list is growing as we speak. It's a very active field of research. So within the microbiota, we're interested in phages. And phages of the human gut uh, are far less studied than bacteria. Uh, but we also know that they are the most abundant viruses in the gut so compared to eukaryotic viruses and archaeal viruses. And that became clear since the very first metagenomic study. Why metagenomics? Because metagenomics so far is our only way to, to have an idea of the diversity of viruses living in the gut. And thanks to my metagenomics again, we also found out that phages are, are pretty stable within the gut of uh, adult um, humans, but they're also very diverse and are far less conserved. For example, the bacterial counterpart is quite difficult to define uh, a core and a standard virum, so um, uh, the composition of bacteria within individuals. And what I put you here is a study from the lab of uh, Colin Hill in Cork, uh, where you see here they analyze different uh, healthy individuals. Um, what you can see here is that their composition in viruses have very little overlap. And, but also that within each individual, this composition remains quite stable. And that's what um, um, I was saying in, in a, a moment ago. Now, if we know the phages are not concerned within individual, we can still find patterns of differential um, diversities of bacteriophages that can be associated to their markers of uh, disease. Disease that are not only gut disease, but um, disease related to, uh, correlated to a change in the microbiota. And this is true for inflammatory bowel disease, diabetes, HIV, colorectal cancer. And, and here again, I put you a, a little picture that I think explains this quite well from the, again, the lab of Colin Hill, where they saw that in Crohn's disease, for example, so Crohn's disease is this inflammatory bowel disease condition that is uh, characterized by a lower diversity of bacteria. Now in these patients, aside to the lower diversity of bacteria, there is an expansion of certain types of bacteriophages. So the, the virulent phages are, are greatly lost uh, in these patients. And there is an expansion of temporary phages. So temporary phages, uh, if you remember, are those that excise from bacteria. So it's, it's quite um, intuitive that they drop the bacterial concentrations. So what we are looking at in the lab, and the, the um, part to, to um, say that what I'm going to present here today is our work on phages and the intestinal tract. And is so I, I've been recently um, employed as an associate professor at the Sorbonne University. So I will tell you a bit of the work we're doing here, but it goes back to the work I was doing as a postdoc in the lab of uh, Laurent de Barbieux at the Institut Pasteur in Paris. So, so what we're looking at is gut phages and their potential as um, killing bacteria within the gut microbiota, and so on modulating the gut microbiota. And another aspect we're interested um, in is the ecology of the interactions between phages and bacteria in the specific environment of the gut. And what I wanna show you is that these two aspects are, are strictly related. Now, I told you that metagenomics is the only way that we can um, study these viruses for now within a complex gut uh, ecosystem. So what we're doing is to take a reductionist approach. We use animal models that we colonize with bacteria and bacteriophages of choice that we can follow and track over time to check their, their abundance and then their action. So it's a, it's a simplified system within a complex system of the mouse microbiota. So the very first thing we have to do if we want to start phages in the gut is to isolate them. Now, I told you there's 10 to the 31 phages out there. Um, we're normally uh, good 
at selecting phages for the species that we want to target. Uh, I already told you that uh, our favorite river in Paris is a good source of phages, but sewage water from Paris is also a good phages and fecal samples from uh, patients and healthy individuals. Now, the very first characterization is based on the ability of phages to form plaques on bacterial loads. Um, and that's our first um, determination. Of, yes, we did find, uh, we did enrich specific phages. And then we went on in all different characterization of their activity uh, and infection uh, through lysis kinetics. So what you see here is like growth curve of bacteria in, bla in, red, in black, sorry. Um, that is targeted by different bacterial phages that drop um, the, 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 the growth of the bacteria. Of course, now we are in 2021, we do sequence our phages, we want to know what they are, we want to know their um, virulent phages for therapeutic uh, purposes, and this is done uh, by sequences. And then we can do all sort of characterization, for example, my, my morphology. And um, once we have a panel of phages that we have characterized, we do assemble them in a, what is called a phage cocktail. And the phage cocktail um, is a need for um, the therapeutic use of phage uh, to combine the action of different viruses. And one of the main reasons that we have to do that is that phages are extremely picky in what they infect. And so we, we proceed in a host range characterization. So it's a phagogram. Um, when I say that they're picky, is that most of the phages we know infect one single species of bacteria, but also most of them, they are very specific to few strains within a species. And here I'll give you a little example. So here you see the lines of um, eight bacterial phages and their dilution on one Pseudomonas aeruginosa strain of a specific serotype, O6. Now, if we take the same eight bacterial phages, and we test them against other cl uh, clinical isolates of different serotypes, you see that they're not all able to infect the other strains. So the, the main uh, aim for, for a therapeutic purpose would be to uh, globally uh, have phages that target different serotypes and different possible uh, infectious uh, agents. So here I put you um, uh, one of the things that we a typical model of, of what we do in this study here, we were, we wanted to reduce the concentration of um, a uropathogenic E. coli strain within the gut microbiota of mice. Um, why targeting uh, uropathogenic pathogens in the gut? But for two main reasons. So the gut is a major uh, as you know, reservoir of uh, opportunistic pathogens. And the second is that this particular strain um, was multi-resistant to uh, and resistant to extend the spectrum beta lactamase. <clears throat> beta lactamase, sorry. Um, so the idea would be to target specifically components of the microbiota that we don't want the carriage for. And so our model is based, we have a, a mouse model, we in, inoculate with E. coli and we treat with the cocktail of bacteriophages. One dose, um, we, we put them a certain concentration and we treat them. And what you see here is that in the presence of phage, we're able to drop, or at least two to three logs, the concentration of bacteria in the fecal sample of the mouse. Another part that um, I didn't put you here, but I wanted to briefly mention um, is that we also check the microbiota of these mice after phage treatment. Uh, and we came to realize that the phage treatment only targets the specific species we put in, but the equilibrium of the rest of the microbiota is, uh, is maintained. And that's um, compared to an antibiotic use, for example, where the, the microbiota is affected globally um, according to the spectrum of the antibiotic use. And as I, as I tell to my students at the university, uh, I make the comparison is that we use antibiotics, uh, you drop a bomb, and yes, you, you probably pick the, the bacterium you want to eliminate, but you also pick everything else. And um, phages are more like hiring a, a sniper, uh, a sniper that is there to specifically uh, kill one bacterium. And that's one of the advantages of the use of phages. And here we have a, a similar study. Uh, this time we were targeting uh, an 
E. coli strain um, adurate invasive. These adurate invasive E. coli are um, very recurrently found in the gut of patients affected by IBV. And in this case, you have, we have a several model. We put E. coli, we put a cocktail of phages, and you see that the presence of bacteriophages drop the concentration of bacteria significantly more than what it drops by itself. But, and this goes back to the question um, I had before, after a first replication of the phages, so we put a, a single dose. Honestly, it doesn't even matter how many we put. As soon as they find their host, they will start replicating and the concentration of phages may be really high. As soon as the concentration of bacteria drop, the concentration of the phages drops too, if they don't find uh, um, a bacterium to infect. And this is related to this auto-limiting uh, property of bacteriophages. Um, another another um, uh, characteristics of this kind of treatment that we find in another model, which is completely similar to what I showed you before, an E. coli strain, a phage cocktail, here you have our, our pretty phages, you see they're all different, um, cause the, the uh, reduction of the colonization of the gut. It goes back to something we cannot even count in the feces, while the phages gets really um, high in concentration by their replicating. So if we will stop the experiment here, we will say that, yeah, we eliminated but, um, our E. coli strain from the gut. However, we don't do know nothing. After another three days, the concentration of bacteria go back up. Um, and the, the phage concentration remains high too. Now, this, um, this opened to us a different question, which is how these two populations of predators and bacteria remain there and why can we not drop the, um, the concentration of bacteria in this sense? And this is where we start looking at, at the ecology of this interaction. How can we improve our treatment so we can put the bacteria down? Um, on the other hand, if we look strictly at an ecological point of view, this is what we see all the time. I showed you that bacteria and our microbiota stay there and phages are pretty stable too. So it's like we have a, a massive population of predators and of prey that coexist in the same environment. Now, to, to answer this question, the very first and obvious uh, hypothesis that we draw is that there will be a mechanism of uh, bacterial resistance uh, involved. Because as for antibiotics, many are the resistant mechanisms deployed by bacteria to defend themselves from bacteriophages. And this, uh, there's a very long number of, of bacterial resistant mechanisms. The most known are probably the fact that the bacteria can hide the receptors uh, at the surface of the bacteria. And there's also other systems that mainly target the genomic enter uh, of the genomic material of the phage inside the cells. And this is restriction modification system, for example, uh, CRISPR-Cas system, uh, world famous now on molecular biology and other applications. But if bacteria can develop uh, resistant mechanisms, the fact that viruses are biological entities that co-evolve with the bacteria leads to the fact that phages can develop counter-resistant mechanisms. Uh, and to do that, they might change affinity for the receptor, for example, if their own receptor is not available anymore. There's anti-restriction mechanism, anti-CRISPR mechanisms, etc. And so we start looking at this, this resistance pattern within our models. Um, so to, to do that, we, we set up uh, an experiment where we compared uh, the coexistence of bacteria and bacteriophages in vitro, in regular flasks, and in the gut of mice. Uh, we used one E. coli strain and three phages that you see here, CLBP1, CB2, and P3. And you see that their pattern of, of uh, co coexistence over time are, are pretty different among them. This, this phage here is lost rapidly in vitro and in vivo. Uh, and then there's a sort of um, equilibrium between the two for the other two phages. So what we did is from the system, we select bacterial clones 
and we looked for resistance. And that's the, the thing I'm, I'm showing you here. In vitro, uh, what you see in black is the percentage of clones that uh, were resistant. We, we test more than 100 for every time and every condition. Uh, at the end of the experiment, like for this phage here, CLDP1, resistance happens pretty quickly. And that explains why the, the phage is rapidly lost. But for the others, there's always a percentage of population that remains sensitive. However, when we looked in vivo, we never found uh, bacteria that were resistant to our phages that we put in. We never found it in this study or in other studies. It doesn't mean that in the gut resist doesn't happen. That would be, that would be uh, nonsense to say because resistance or uh, resistances were found in the gut environment. What I'm saying here is that the proportion of this clone alone uh, difficulty have a difficulty to explain this coexisting because they're not abundant at all. And so uh, we had to start looking at different way of coexistence. Uh, within, within the gut between phages and bacteria, because resistance would not explain it all. Uh, we developed several hypotheses, and that's uh, what I will talk, you, um, talk to you about in a minute. But uh, first, I'd like to know whether you have any questions about this part, that it was more the, the therapeutic approach. Do you guys have any questions? Um, I I have a, I have a question. Um, you show at the beginning of this section that you were testing the if if these phages cocktails were working by having in vivo studies in the um, in the mice gut, and one of the examples is that you use uropathogenic E. coli, and then you were able to see that it was reduced in the colonization in the gut. I wonder how do you think these results would translate if the infection would be at a different uh, place in the body in a different system, like for example for uropathogenic E. coli, if it would be in the urinary tr tract system. Is there any data about how phages would go to that site of infection or anything like that? Yes, as a matter of fact, there's also a clinical trial going on now. Um, there you have to, we have to take into account different, um, uh, different properties. For example, pH is a great, great limitation and we really need to select phages that will be active at the site of infection. But yes, indeed, there's a, there is a study and this last clinical trial, they're doing a, a intraparental administration directly to treat urinary tract infections. There's also more related, but a more distant application that is, is treating um, medical devices like catheters, which are a great source of urinary tract infections with phages like for any other uh, alternative um, uh, therapies. But yeah, absolutely, the site of infection is crucial. And it's one of the things that I, I will also talk about. Uh, and we need to think of where we put our phages for them to be active. For example, in the blood, there would not be the same as uh, the lung of the gut. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, with antibiotics, this is the, um, the role of the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, try to see how much of the active compound is at the site of infection. There is a lot of uh, regulatory metabolic, metabolic systems and all that's going to play a role in how much is actually working in the site where it's supposed to be working. It's really interesting it about the use of phages for, as a, a preventive method. So when you're using devices and catheters and that, that's super interesting. Carl, yeah, is yeah, for, for, yes, yeah, so just to comment, if I can, uh, there, there's some, some PKPD studies for phages, but they're not actually, um, yeah, we cannot really generalize, but it's starting. It's, of course, it's very much behind for that for other drugs, but of course, that's, that's of interest. And, um, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's the thing. There's also some neutralizing antibodies that have been found that could impact on this activity, but the, the clinical relevant, relevance is still, is still to be fine. It's still really new. Uh, Carl is asking, do the phages regulate their own production not to overproduce and kill all hosts in the environment? That's a very good question. Because ecologically, indeed, it would make sense. Like for, for every predator, uh, they need prey, especially for obligate parasites. Um, 
there is a no known mechanism for, for virulent phages. However, for example, it, it is mentioned that for temporal phages, though that those that um, integrate their genome into the bacteria, this is very well regulated by bacterial density, meaning that in abundance of bacteria, uh, lysogenic phages have uh, um, an advantage in performing leaching cycles and um, reproduce themselves and create more particles. But whenever the, the bacteria are not abundant, the interest in the phages to to assure the replication of their own copies of genome within the bacterial cells. And uh, yeah, that's a very well regulated and known mechanism for those phages. Really cool indeed uh, mechanism. There's, there's a few studies also on um, phages being able to respond to quarantine sensing molecules from bacteria. Uh, and these again is strictly related to, to having the necessity of monitoring the concentration of the, the bacterial host to, to assure their own survival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit like they're listening in and when they hear that there's a lot of bacteria out there, it's like it's time now to start replicating and we... we yeah, we, I, I, I love you know. this uh, anthropomorphic uh, research, but that's, that's how it is. And it, we can see it this way or, or just for a purely uh, evolutionary ecological uh, perspective, it would not be an advantage to have a lot of predators with no prey. Um, all right, I think we might continue. Uh, there is one more question. Let me see. Since phages are so selective, will there be a specialized diagnostics required to know what phages to prescribe? This is a very interesting question. That's a very very interesting question, and yeah, that's the big difference in what I was telling you before. Uh, the difference between having a general use, like for any drugs, and this compassionate use. Indeed, we do, do know to, to we don't need to know which kind of pathogens is, is causing the infection. And that's the that's the limit compared to antibiotics, where we could we could expand it right to that the species is needed. I think we can find a, a compromise in having a lot of different banks uh, of phages active already. We know they're active for different uh, uh, clones within uh, or strains within a species. But absolutely, we do not need to know at least the species. And sometimes, as I show you, that the serotypes are important. That's not even enough. For the compassionate use, that's easy because the clinical lab, the diagnostic labs would be isolating the, the strains. And that's actually a requirement for the regulatory agency because it's compatible use, compassionate use, but it's still very well regulated. We need to show before that the phages we have are active against the pathogen is infected a specific patient. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I think I hope this answered the question. Um, I, I think we might continue with the with the presentation. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so as I as I was saying, we need the basis of the next part of the presentation is we need to find a way to, to understand this coexistence between these two populations, which is not based on resistance. And the first thing that we uh, look at, sorry, yes, is, uh, so we ask ourselves whether phages could adapt to different um, hosts within the microbiota. So I already told you that microbiota is a complex environment and uh, different possible hosts are, are, are there. And so to answer this question, instead of doing what, what I showed you before, having multiple phages against one bacterium, we took one phage that you see here, it's called P10, uh, and two bacteria, a bacterium that is able to infect, this is an E. coli strain LF82 and a durant invasive E. coli. Uh, so it, this is the strain on which the phage was isolated. So it is its host. But we also use another bacterial strain, MG1655, a normal commensal KTL12 E. coli, that the phages is not able to infect. Uh, when I say it's not able to infect, it means that you cannot even recognize any receptor. Uh, and so the, the bacterium is basically invisible to the phage. And what we did, so what, what we asked is that can this phage adapt? to infect a strain that is not able to infect beforehand. Again, to, to, to answer the, this question, we had a different model. Uh, we have a model in vitro, 
a model and two models in vivo. One is based on dixenic mice. So dixenic mice are mice that are originally axenic, where we do insert two, the two E. coli strains that we want to study. And we have conventional mice with their own regular microbiota in which we add the two E. coli strains that we want to study. And we follow their coevolution over time when 24 days and we count the phages and the bacteria um, over time and we check whether the phage could adapt to strain MG1655. And so what you have here is that um, in vitro and in dixenic mice, we do still find phages, but those phages were only infecting the strain LF82, their host. However, when we look in conventional mice, uh, after 11 days and then more and more, we found that the phage learn to adapt and infect the strain MG1655. That's what you see in this box here. You see that the phage is now able to form plaques on both strains. This doesn't happen all the time. It's about 20% uh, rate of adaptation within the different mice that we, that we analyzed. And so the next question was, why do we find this, um, this event only in the conventional mice? and not in vitro or in dixenic mice. Well, what we hadn't realized is that within the microbiota of the mouse, there were other E. coli strains, especially this strain here that we call mouse E. coli 1. Uh, they came from the microbiota of mice and the, our phage was able to infect. So it's, it actually, uh, uh, what we did not know is that we were not able um, we were not looking at the coevolution of E. coli with the two strains we put in, but there was an additional strain. So there were three E. coli hosts. And so we, we wonder whether this host here was responsible, was mediating the adaptation of the, of the fish. And to answer this question, we had a, a, another model of coevolution in vitro. And we saw that when we put these three E. coli together, or even just MEC1 plus MGC655, we saw that the phage could adapt. And so this adaptation happens by an intermediate host, the population of bacteria that learn how to infect different hosts within the gut and expand actually the population of phages with different host strains. Now, the, the fact that um, phages, uh, viruses can change host is not new. Uh, a virus that change host is the reason why I cannot see you in person today. I cannot have a nice weekend in Sweden because there is a pandemic and this pandemic come from a virus. The, the change it came from different animals and uh, reached the human species. Uh, what we did show is that whenever we have a complex microbial environment, um, these events are more likely to happen and in our microbiota that can sustain a diversity uh, and the evolution of, of the microbial partners in our gut. Uh, so the next question we asked here is that how? Uh, how this, did this phage adapt? And um, we did a population genomic study. So we looked at the population of the virus in the different um, experimental settings. So in vivo, in vitro, in the, in the dixenic mice, in the conventional mice. And we find patterns of, of mutation that were more or less uh, frequent. What really caught our attention is this little mutation here. This is one little SNP, uh, one uh, nucleotide change, one amino acid change in one of the tail fibers genes. Uh, so the tail fibers are reminded that the, the, the proteins that bind the material receptors. Uh, so we ask ourselves, can this one SNP, just one, be um, responsible for um, the, the phage adaptation. And so we did, what we did was a, a recombinant phage where we only mutated that particular SNP in the tail fibers. And what we show is that once we did that, the phage was indeed able to infect both um, the, the E. coli strain LF82 and the MG1655. So one SNP is sufficient. However, what we also saw is that the fitness of the space, this capacity of, multi, uh, of replicating on, on this bacteria is far lower than its original host. So there's a fitness cost to it. However, when we keep replicating these recombinant phages only on the MGCC55, so the new host, 
that um, leads to a rapid adaptation and a ready, uh, rapid increase in the infectious capacity of the virus. Um, that becomes even higher than what it was already, uh, originally able to do on its original host. Uh, and this is due to the fact that the, uh, following this one mutation, more mutation can accumulate uh, and improve the fitness. Uh, and so we came to realize that whenever there's a um, higher abundance of one particular host, the phage was specialized to, to infect uh, that particular bacterium. And if we think again, um, from the gut point of view, while well, we could assume that the hosts are not always in the same proportion, um, that justified the, the diversification of different populations. Um, another question that we asked was um, related to the fact that the gut is a very structured environment, uh, both longitudinally, so you know that there's different gut section, here you see a, a cartoon of a mouse gut, but also transversally. So there's, there's the epithelial cells, there's the mucosa with the mucus layer, and there's uh, uh, the lumen inside uh, the, the, the intestinal tract. And so we took a, another mouse model. This is a, a neurobiotic mouse model. So it's got a defined microbiota where we put one E. coli strain here and three phages cocktail. And in this system here, uh, that's a lot of graphs I know, but what I want to show you is that there's, there is an impact of the phage. It's not a massive impact. Um, we look at feces, uh, of course, so there's a little decrease, but um, not as uh, prominent as what I showed you before. And then we looked at organs. So when we look at organs, we look specifically at, at the lumen of the gut and the mucus. Uh, and there again, there's, uh, there's uh, different results. What, what, we, what we counted the, um, the number of phages in the mucus, we realized that in the mucus, there's far less phages than in the lumen. Uh, and to make this uh, more clear, um, what we showed is that E. coli, our E. coli, so it could colonize the, the mucus. So, so E. coli is here in red and the mucus is in green. And here you have the epithelial cells. Um, and we did find that E. coli was, was well colonizing the outer part of the mucus. But when we looked at the ratio between phages and bacteria within the mucus and in the lumen, this ratio was definitely lower within the mucus. Now we do know that for phages to infect, there, there has to be a, a minimal concentration of bacteria for them to, to infect. If this threshold is now reached, um, infection becomes more difficult. And so out of this result, we proposed a model. Um, and this model, we, we borrowed it from ecology. It's a sourcing sink dynamic. Uh, it's based on the fact that uh, we think that in the mucus, there is a source of bacteria, the bacteria are able to more replicate within uh, this environment uh, and be able to colonize the lumen where it's a sink because they are more uh, subjected to phage predation. And the equilibrium between the, the, the two uh, leads to sustain both populations. We have a population of preys and bacteria that coexist because the environment is structured. Um, if, we, if we move it up, uh, this model to, to animal, uh, higher animal models, uh, it would be like um, having this situation of predators and prey where uh, the rabbits can um, reproduce within uh, the rabbit hole where they're protected from predators. But as soon they, as they uh, come out for looking for food, uh, they are subjected to predation. And that would be our source and sink. Uh, the very final thing I'd like to touch about is that um, we realized that Phage replication within the gut is variable. Um, here, uh, I'll show you a variability that we find in vitro, and that's known to most phage biologists. Phages are active if cells are actively replicating. And uh, this is, for example, the activity of these three phages in culture in exponential phase or in stationary phase. And you see the stationary phase, most phages struggle to infect. Well, this is the same if we take different section ex vivo of the mouse gut that are colonized with our E. coli. Um, we took the ileum, the feces, uh, the colon, the cecum, and phages have differential ability to replicate within these environments. And so we 
we uh, hypothesized that the physiology of the bacteria within the gut environment had an effect on um, uh, phage replication. And so to, to, to look into this a bit more, uh, we did an RNA-seq experiment where we compared the transcription profile of E. coli in stationary phase, in exponential phase, and in the colon of mice. And we looked for specifically genes that were underexpressed within the colon. Um, and you see here that, that the profiles are, are very different. And within the genes that were differentially expressed in the colon, we look at genes that could impact the interaction between phages and bacteria. And we got really interested uh, from the fact that a uh, proportion of these genes were related to flagellum and, and motility of the bacteria and to LPS. And both these structures are known receptors for bacteria for bacteriophages. Uh, so we picked uh, two genes that were largely uh, underexpressed. Uh, one is the RFIL gene, this is the ligase of the O antigen um, of the LPS uh, E. coli, and flea A that regulates the, the assembly of the flagella. We've made mutants in, in the E. coli stream for that. And what we saw is that these mutants, this, um, when they are exposed to our phages, for example, for RFIL, they display a degree of resistance. This is true for RFIL, so we can conclude that the O antigen is important for, for um, infection of these phages. And also to our surprise, to be honest, um, both mutants in the presence of phages entrain a, a massive production of biofilm. And biofilm is also known to, to protect some material from phage uh, predation. Uh, we still haven't wrapped our heads around this, this increased production of biofilm. So if you have any suggestion on what's going on, I would be happy to, to take it. And so to conclude, what we, what we saw is that um, the interaction with phages and bacteria in the gut depends on, on different systems. The, this is probably um, far to be uh, complete and more and more things have to be found and more things have been very, uh, would be very phage specific. But uh, so what I showed you is that there are phenomena of adaptation and coevolution with different hosts within the microbiota. Um, we can find spatial refuges for bacteria that can uh, replicate without being subjected to phage predation. And there's an impact of bacterial physiology, which is not related on, on bacterial mutations. That's what we were looking at before, but simply on the fact that the phages um, cannot infect uh, bacteria in all their physiological states. So what, how um, this information can help us with phage therapy is that we need to find phages that are uh, active in vivo, in vivo because they can access to mucus, for example, if it's uh, related to the gut, because they infect bacteria in the sites of, of infection, of colonization. And we also have to consider, consider that phage, um, phage evolved and change according to their environment and the host they find, and their specificity change, which is a good and a bad, uh, an advantage and a disadvantage of this kind of treatments. But altogether, um, with this, um, uh, paying attention to this factor can help in treating infection disease, modulate the microbiota, which is, for example, what we find in fecal transplant and modulation of microbiota. Uh, overall, the, the, the final message is that we need more clinical trials to prove um, our hypothesis. On this, I'd like to conclude. So I told you that the, the work I present you was uh, a mix of the work I've been doing um, at the Institut Pasteur and uh, the Saint Antoine Research Center in Paris, where I am today. Um, a, a big part of the work was done by Martha, PhD student uh, in Pasteur, and Lorenzo, PhD student uh, here with me now. This is our phage group. We're in a, in a, in a unit which is led by Philip Seixit and Ari Sokol. We have a, a phage group. Unfortunately, we don't have a group picture yet, uh, but the final picture we had is a Zoom picture, but I would like to, to, to show you all the group uh, um, still. And of course, big thanks to our collaborators and our fundings. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer any final questions you might have. Thank you so much, Luisa. Really, really nice presentation and really nice work. And as a biologist, I 
I find incredibly interesting to see how this ecology and how this physiology and the systems are actually playing a role in the whole dynamics of, of how, how the ecology is. Um, any questions from our audience? You guys could also unmute yourself, pose the question if you want, or we have a hand. Uh, Linus, yes, please, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask. Yes, thank you very much for a very nice uh, talk and very interesting with the evolution of the phage. Uh, I, I was just curious, when, when you add a specific host together with your phage in, in these experiments, and you see them evolve into using a second host that initially are, is the worst host, so to say, they, they replicate worse in, in those ones. Why don't they use the, the original host instead? Why, why? Because the original host was still there. I, I that's the thing. I yes. If I had no, no, I, 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 I totally understand. Uh, our it was more about a basic question on trying to understand how this mutation would impact the fitness of the page. Because what we wonder is why do we not pick up this um, this mutation? Could we? Could it be that the mutation happens, but since uh, the fitness cost to it is, to, is much greater than what we have. Being the gut, a, a dynamic environment, so what goes in fl flashes out, we're not able to recover this experiment. And that's why we, we wanted to see uh, how this mutation got fixed in a population. And we found that it is the presence of this multiple host entries. Because mutations happen all the time. It's, it's hard to think that, um, also we, we tried very hard, that it would not happen since mutation are, 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 are randomly from, from the polymerase. So why did we not fix? And we, we think it's because there's this fitness cost. Then of course, if we put the original uh, host that the population will shift and, and remain um, targeting the most abundant, for example, the pathogenic people. Mm. I don't know if but, that answered your question. Yeah, but I, I was, it was kind of a bit. Yes, <laughs> but when you saw this shift, so if you go back to, or think back to the experiments where you had in vitro resistance evolution among the bacteria, which is what people have described a lot, right? Yeah. But in vivo, you didn't see that. Um, yes. But the original host was still around, right? Yes. So why, where, where how did it escape? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I'd love to be able to answer yeah, this. Okay. <laughs> uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's the dream, um, especially for a therapeutic purpose. So one of the answers would be, um, is it not acceptable because uh, there's, there's a physiological, so it's dormant, mm. it, it's, uh, the, the physiology is different, the receptor is masked, but still uh, there's no mutation inside. The, the problem is that it, it's still there in the gut, as soon as we pull them out and we, we test our resistance in a petri dish, mm. the condition will not be the same. That's mm. why it's on the physiology uh, of this bacteria. If we, if, once we pull them out of the gut, uh, we already lost the context of where we're looking at. And yes, we do not find resistance in a petri dish, but what happens in the gut that might be. But, but, the, but the phage could still replicate, so they must have been. Yes. It, it, maybe it's the rabbit hole. It's not, it's not, um, yeah, but for example, that's why we did this special um, heterogeneous study. A portion of the bacteria might still, I have to be still there. But this happens in, in every environment, which is the gut, the ocean, plants, phages and bacteria are still there. So is it just a matter of encountering uh, and there's uh, local events of amplification of phages in one part where the bacteria are more abundant. That is that is one of the um, hypotheses, but it, it's very related to to the structure of the environment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a uh, Darmed has also raised his hand. Darmed, would you like to pose a question? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Louisa, for a very nice talk. Um, I'm kind of interested in two different things you spoke about. You mentioned uh, clinical trials. And then you also mentioned the specificity of the phage, which I think is both a great advantage in terms of protecting the microbiome, but also a disadvantage in you know, finding the right phage for the target that you want to get. But when you were talking, I went and looked a little bit online and I was surprised that there seems to be very, very few 
clinical trials ongoing, possibly none at the moment. And I was putting these two things together. I, I was wondering, do you know, um, are people interested in looking at uh, tuberculosis in terms of phage therapy? The, the reason I bring this up is uh, TB is a bacteria that, you know, is specialized in humans. It has no other function on earth except to cause us damage. Uh, it wouldn't do us any harm if it was made extinct. And it's extremely invariable. It seems to me to be an ideal target for a phage. And when I, the clinical trials I did look at seem to be looking at uh, respiratory tract infections with pseudomonas. So. Yes. <clears throat> well, you, you bring up uh, um, an excellent point uh, because a most stable, uh, we can say, pathogen, it would be an ideal target. Mm -hmm. So just, just to comment, there are clinical trials ongoing. Uh, there's some registered at least um, in the US and in, in Europe, but it's true they're mainly focusing on SK pathogens, TAF, Cydomona, C. coli, mm -hmm. et etc. Um, I guess there's also, um, it's, it's bad to say it, but it's also um, as a matter of interest and finding economic uh, um, and fundings for that, because that's one of the main limits so far. There's no big pharmaceutical company. But, but even, in, even in terms of economics, TB would seem almost like an ideal target. To I go agree for. with you. So there, there's a, a, the number of um, um, phages find, found for TB, it's enormous. There's catalogs and catalogs of, of phages found for this species, which is the most rare for, for most bacterial phages. Mm -hmm. The, um, species. However, it's true that I'm not aware of any trial on every any um, large scale application. Could I could I just have a quick follow up? Do, sure. do you know if anybody has investigated the economics of developing a phage <laughs> versus the economics of trying to develop a new uh, antibiotic? Because one of the reasons big pharma has left the antibiotics is largely because the economics are unfavorable. Yes, and so there's two things, there's economics and there's intellectual knowledge, because a fish cannot be patented. And I guess this is the main limit. Uh, we can patent cocktails, application technologies for phages, but not the phage itself as a natural product. And this is, is a big put up for big companies. So, um, I don't, I'm not aware of a real comparison um, to, to antibiotics, but the economic limitation comes to the fact that there's little advantage uh, for big companies to infect. On the other hand, uh, what has been a bit worked out is that um, if fish therapy will be um, approved and more launched um, at the level of our kind of countries, fungus fundings will be mostly public or government, governmental, it coming from most biotech, small biotechs, um, which is of course a, a, a not so high source of money. And this is why the, the, it will be a joint effort, this is the estimation from different biotechs, but the, the investment uh, and the level of uh, involvement uh, must be uh, big with a big sense of uh, putting efforts together to develop. I don't think, at the moment, it would be of interest of, of big pharma. Okay, thank you. It's my personal opinion, Tom. Sure. But the economics does not turn towards an advantage for that. As soon as there's a real product, why not? But I don't see, uh, this is my, again, my personal thing. As soon as there's no a real working product that's been shown to be working, uh, I don't see how the companies would want to invest in something, which is a big a question mark. Sure, somebody has to be the first and show Yes, the and that's the, I think that's, that's yeah. the main thing that puts a, a limit at the moment. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Dharmat, so much for the question. Um, we are already a little bit over time, so I think Sorry. we are going to leave it here again. Thank you so much for presenting your work in this seminar series. Your talk is going to be available in our YouTube channel later for anybody that wants to rewatch it or watch it for the first time or share it around. And you are also going to be part of our episode release at the beginning of July. So if anybody wants to learn a little bit more about your path, they are advised to go there. 
other than that, I wish you a very, very nice weekend. I hope the weather gets better. And all of you, I hope to see you back in our next UAC activity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Luisa. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.